Bible to Mark chapter 12, if you will, please. Mark chapter 12. In this auditorium this morning are people who have served the Lord for a long, long time. And they know what it means to press on. And I'm sure that there's been many times that they have been discouraged along the way. But God always gives us the strength to press on. Someone came up to me this morning and said, Happy third anniversary. And uh, I'd really forgotten it, but this is three years that I've been pastor. It seems like three weeks. And uh, I've enjoyed these three, three uh, years with you folks. And thank the Lord for your goodness. I want to thank Miss Hill for leading the choir this morning. Did you notice, I don't know whether you noticed or not, but Brother Hill, I love Brother Hill, but did you notice that Penny has a little more rhythm? Have you noticed that? Just a little more rhythm than uh, Brother Hill does. And uh, that's not negative, that's just my uh, observation. Uh, tonight we'll be in Revelation chapter 6. I hope that you'll come and pray with us at 6 o'clock this evening, and then at 6.30 our evening service, and uh, we'll be in Revelation chapter 6, Riders of Judgment. And the first ho white horse rider comes out on the scene. There is another white horse rider in Revelation 19, but they are not the same person. I think the rider in chapter 6 is the Antichrist, and we'll show you why tonight as we begin to study uh, the book of Revelation and go through the book of Revelation chapter 6 and on through the book. I asked Jim to just get me a little information on our website, and this is just for one month, the month of November, and November's not over yet. We've had 4,465 hits just in this month of November. We've had 18,609 pages assessed. Our sermon page has been hit 891 times. The school photos, 800 times. And then visits from foreign countries, 42 foreign countries. We've had visits from them. Brazil, for instance, 238. The United Kingdom, 271. Israel, 6. And the Philippines, 104. So our webpage is getting out and our people are around the world and in the United States are seeing our church and our ministries, listening to the, the sermons, and I thank the Lord for that. And I just wanted you to know uh, that uh, we have a far-reaching ministry other than just Raleigh, and thank the Lord for that. We went down uh, to a business establishment on Friday, uh, Jim and Brother Barham and I, and then on the way back, something happened, frankly, that causes me to be a little concerned about Brother Barham. He said, now we're going to stop at the hog shack. And I said, now I was raised on a farm. I saw all the pigs I want to see. And uh, that wasn't what it was. It's a motorcycle place. <laughs> and Brother Barham walked in there and his eyes lit up like a Christmas tree. I mean, it was like a, a little boy in a toy shop. And those great big, as he called them, big old hogs sitting there. And uh, I, how excited that he was. And I, I was thinking, if you've got time, let's go over to the golf shop and you'll see me light up a little bit. <laughs> but uh, he wasn't, wasn't interested in that. I guess it takes a little more skill. But anyway, uh, I thought about that. And so you, you pray for him. Uh, I went riding one time, one time. A preacher friend of mine got me on his. He got up to about 85 miles an hour, took a corner, and I thought he went one way and I went another. And I said, Lord, if you'll get me off this thing, I'll never ride again. And I haven't, and I'm going to try to keep that promise. And uh, so anyway, now that doesn't have anything to do with anything except I wanted to tell it. All right. In Mark chapter 12, and we'll begin reading in verse 41, Mark chapter 12 and verse 41, Jesus, a widow, and two mites. Jesus, a widow, and two mites. Verse 41, And Jesus sat over against the treasury, and beheld how the people cast money into the treasury. And many that were rich cast in much. And there came a certain poor widow, and she threw in two mites, which make a farthing. And he called unto him his disciples, and saith unto them, Verily I say unto you, that this poor widow hath cast more in than all they which have cast into the treasury. For all they did cast in of their abundance, but she of her want did cast in all that she had, 
even all her living. Have you ever thought of all of the unnamed people in the Bible? For instance, if you'll go to the book of Hebrews, you'll see a great list of men and women in the hall of faith and God's honor roll, whatever you want to call it, and you'll see David's name and you'll see Gideon and you'll see Abraham and you'll see Moses. And then you'll come to about verse 35 and there's just simply two words there that stick out, and others. And the Bible said they had uh, cruel mockings and they were scourged and uh, they were swan asunder and they were cast about. And there's no name. There's no way you can put a name uh, to these people. There's no way you can put a face to these people. Yet God knows who they are. And I'm sure that as they suffered, and I'm sure that as they died, I'm sure that as they gave their life that the Lord was looking and He was marking what happened to them. It was written down in God's uh, book what happened to them. And uh, they will be announced and we'll know who they are in eternity. But so much has been accomplished in the Bible through men and women of whom we do not know their name, unnamed people. And there are people in our congregation this morning who are unnamed as far as the world is concerned, unnamed as far as the accolades of this world is concerned. But I want to say to you this morning, God knows who you are. And He knows your labor. And He knows the uh, input that you have in the lives of others. And so never ever come to the place where you feel you're insignificant in the work of God. Uh, you may not be called doctor. Uh, you may never be called on to stand before the congregation to sing. You ne may never present a message. Uh, you may never get your picture on the website. You may never get your name out before people, but yet God knows who you are. I thought about that when I looked at this passage of Scripture. Look at verse 41 again. And Jesus sat over against the treasury. Don't you think He saw a lot of people coming and going and the different people that He noticed as they came in? And yet here is this one individual that catches his eye. And the Bible says that she's a widow and she's poor. Now to a lot of folk, that wouldn't bring any attention at all, would it? I'm sure this week you passed by a lot of widows. You never thought about them much. Uh, there wasn't much exciting about them. You didn't know much about their lives. I'm sure that this week you and I passed by a lot of poor people and we might not have noted them or seen anything significant about them. But yet may I say this morning that if they have been faithful to God and are faithful to Him, the Lord takes note of them and takes note of you. And so here is an unnamed individual in the Word of God, a widow, and by the way, women in that uh, time and in that culture were not held in very high esteem anyway. And uh, actually Jesus is the one that lifted women to a higher plane. And this woman is poor, and yet Jesus took note of her. Have you ever thought how much is done in the church by unknown people? Have you ever thought about how much has been done down through the years in this church, Noose Baptist Church, through unknown people, people who just quietly go about their business, people who quietly go about their work for God. They don't have to have the accolades. They don't need the accolades. They understand that their names are written in heaven. They understand that one day they'll stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And if they've been faithful, they'll hear the Lord say to them, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. And by the way, I think that's a, a more important phrase than what my name might be if the Lord just simply says, doesn't call my name or your name, but says, well done, you good and faithful servant. And so much can be done through unnamed, unknown, seemingly insignificant people. And in the church, much is done through people who are not known. For instance, faithful attendance. You know, I thank God for people who are just here. Amen. And uh, they're always here. You can just count on them. On Sunday morning, they'll be here. On Sunday night, they'll be here. On Wednesday night, they'll be here. Uh, they realize that they might not be able to contribute large sums of money. They realize that they may not have the greatest education, little background. They understand that they might not be in, in who's who uh, of society. They realize that they're limited in a lot of ways, but they really know there's one thing they can do. I'll be there. 
when the doors are open, I will be there. I see uh, uh, people coming in like Rose and Nancy and, and other people and Tony uh, on a crutch and, and so forth, and, and they may feel like, you know, uh, I can't contribute a lot, but really they can contribute a whole lot to the ministry of God and to the work of God, and it's a blessing to me as pastor just to see them sitting there and to see people who will come in and people who will be faithful. And then those who are unknown through their unselfish work. Uh, it's good to get a pat on the back. It's good to be cheered. It's, it's good to hear someone say, I'm thanking God for you, but yet uh, they're just simply serving the Lord unselfishly and faithfully and going all the way through. You know, some people, if you don't mention their name, they get upset. And some people, if you don't know what they're doing, they get upset. Uh, they have to have the comments, and they have to have the accolades, and they have to have the strokes. Now, by the way, there's nothing wrong to walking up to a man and say, I appreciate you. There's nothing wrong walking up to a woman and say, I appreciate you. In Romans and in Corinthians, Paul mentions the names of people over and over and over again. Uh, some people of wealth, uh, some people with no wealth at all, some people of esteem, some people of no esteem whatsoever. And yet he mentions their name and he said, I thank God for you. And there's something about that and something to be said for that. But thank God for the person that doesn't need the accolades. Thank God for the person who's just willing to give unselfishly. And then the person who gives untiring service. I'm amazed at some folk what they get done. I'm amazed at, at the energy that they seem to have. And I'm amazed at what they accomplish. And it just seems like they go on and they go on and they go on and they go on. Now, I think I'd like to stop right here. And I think I'd like to caution you not to take on too much. You can only do what God has gifted you to do. Are you listening? You can only do what God has really called you to do. And you get outside of that, uh, you're, there's a danger of burnout. And I want to caution our leaders and I think the Lord, that, uh, that Brother Dwight has this idea. Uh, Brother Dwight understands that everybody can't do under everything, and he doesn't pressure everybody to do everything. He understands, and I understand, that if God's gifted you and have called you to a prison ministry, you'll be successful. But you know, some people probably shouldn't go to the prison ministry. And some people probably shouldn't work in Awana. And some people, like me, shouldn't sing in the choir. Why is it that you seem to really enjoy it when I say that? I, I, don't, I don't know, and the choir seems to have glee uh, when, I, when I say that. But I shouldn't do that. I don't have the voice. Uh, I don't have the talent to sing in the choir. I can only do what God's called me to do. You know what my gifts are? Pastor, teacher. That's it. I'm not an evangelist, and uh, there's a lot of things I can't do, but I have been gifted of God to be a pastor, teacher. Now, I try to get out of that, and I try to stretch that, I'm in trouble. I can only do so much. I can only be in one place at one time, and I'm not going to wear out early, and you shouldn't try to wear out early. Find the place where God's called you to serve. But there are some of you that just seem to be untiring, and you seem to go on, and you keep going, and I thank God for you. And then there are those who are unknown, but they're so faithful in the matter of sacrificial giving. Uh... I don't know what everyone gives in this church. I don't want to know. And I don't want to have my hand in a lot of things, even though I want to be able to see what's going on and know and understand so I can have a hand on it and can lead the church properly. But I can say this. If some folk knew what some people in this church gave, you'd be astounded. There are some folk in this church that you'd think probably not giving much. Uh, but if you knew what they did, you'd be astounded and what they feel like that God would have them to do. And some of them have amazed me through an unselfish uh, act of God in giving, and they've said to me, that's not enough. I want God to bless me so I can give more, and more, and more, and more. Now, here's a lady that uh, gave and gave sacrificially to the work of God, even though she's unknown and unrecognized by the world, but understood the importance of giving to God. Now, we begin our uh, All Tithers campaign this Sunday, and we're pointing toward December the 5th, where we're asking those who have never tithed to begin tithing. 
and maybe some that are giving some but are not giving the full tithe. And then maybe God would call upon some of you to give above the tithe. And maybe God would call some of you to do what many of us are going to do and give a, a double tithe on that Sunday uh, to the work of God. Uh, this lady, I think, even though poor and unknown, had an understanding of the importance of money and the importance of giving. Think with me now. Money is essential. This poor would have had to live, didn't she? I mean, she had needs. She had to eat. Uh, she had to have clothing. Uh, she had to have a place to stay. Uh, she had the essentials of life uh, that needed to be taken care of. And money is essential. We have to pay bills, don't we? And uh, you, you have to see that food is on the table. And so as you look at the matter of money, you remember that it is essential and that it has to be there for you uh, to meet the needs of life. But can I say to you, uh, money may be essential, but I think it's overrated. It doesn't provide what a lot of people think it will provide. And you can see that by the lifestyles of those who have so much. I don't know who the actor was. I, I forget his name now. Uh, but bought his uh, servant, his right-hand man, uh, over a million-dollar home, just purchased it for him, all that kind of money, and he's just, just giving and, and so forth. Now, I know what some of you are saying. I'd like to trace. Uh, I, I know that. I understand that. But when you see people who have a lot of money, uh, they go in a lot of different directions, don't, don't they? The drug scene liquor scene, the lust scene, all the rest of it, and it just doesn't seem to bring them the hats that they bring. Yes, money is essential, but it's overrated. It can't bring to you peace of heart, and it can't bring to you peace of mind, and it can't bring to you joy. It can't, you can't buy the power of God with it. You can't buy salvation with it. And so even though we've got to have it, uh, well, there's a right way of looking at it. Money can bring great good and can do great good. And if used properly, it can be used for the glory of God. But money can bring great evil also. I've uh, noticed down through the years in my ministry and preaching, 42, going on 43 years now, that sometimes people who had very little and then all of a sudden came into some wealth or came into some money went away from the things of God and went away from church and started using the money not for good but uh, for evil, and we have to be very, very careful when it comes to the matter of money. It must be used properly. But you've got to remember that it can bring bondage. It's an amazing so many Christians can't do anything for God because of credit card debt. People are in need, but we can't reach out and help them because we're so strapped financially. And the idea that we have to have better homes and better cars and better things and all of that will make us happy. And yet when we acquire these things, we're so uh, in bondage to things and so in, in bondage to money that we can't give to the cause of Christ. We can't help people that have needs. One of the joys of this church has been down through the years of helping people in need. One of the great joys of this church down through the years is being able to look around at our missionaries and when a missionary letter comes and we have a need, we're able to help with that need. And you know what happens then? When God blesses us and we have a surplus and we use that surplus to help others, God just keeps pouring right back in. He's always done that. He always will do that. And so yet there are some Christians who do not know the freedom of debt-free living. They don't know the freedom of being able to have an excess so that they can help another man in need, another woman in need, so they can give the mission, so they can give to the work of God, and so that they can have the blessings of God up on their life. Money can bring great bondage. It must be used properly, and we ought to see to it that our money brings glory to God. Now, I want to notice several things this morning concerning this woman, her Jesus, and her two mites. Look at verse 41 and notice where Jesus sits. And Jesus sat over against the treasury. Somebody says, God's not worried about your money. God's not worried about your giving. Now, let me say this at the outset. If you don't tithe today, God's not going to go broke. Have you got that? Did you know he owns a cattle on a thousand hills already? God's not poor. 
But God wants you and I to have the right understanding and the right outlook concerning our finances. And He can use finances to teach us great lessons. And He can use us to be a blessing and encouragement to others when it comes to the matter of finances. And so look at verse 41. And Jesus set over against the treasury. Uh, so apparently Jesus was con very concerned about some things. Uh, I wonder if He noticed and took note and was concerned with our offertory time this morning. Do you think he was? Do you think that our Lord is up in heaven and he's still concerned with the tithes and offerings of God's people at Moose Baptist Church? I think he is. As a matter of fact, I think as the ushers came down this morning and the offering plates were passed, I think he took note of what we did this morning. And I think he's concerned about what we do in the area of our finances because he knows that if he has our heart, he has our money. Let me say that again. If he has our heart, he has our money. But if we're willing, as Malachi said, listen, to rob God, and a lot of believers are willing to do that, we wouldn't go out and rob a bank, but we'll rob God. We'll rob the God who gave us salvation through His Son, Jesus Christ. We'll rob God who has always been there for us, to love us, to care for us, to take care of us, but we'll rob Him. Wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and in offerings. Now, I stand here as a preacher of several years, and I know the criticisms that preachers get. And I know the criticism that the church gets. All you're interested is the money. All you ever talk about is the money. If you've been here during the three years that I've been your pastor, you know that a lot of times I say very little about money. God's blessed us. God has been good to us. But as a preacher of the gospel, I must say something about the matter of tithing because it's in the Bible. I must say something about giving because it's in the Word of God. I must say something about it because I want you to experience the joy and the blessing that my wife and I have experienced down through the years and the way that God has taken care of us. David said, I was young, now I'm old. I've never seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging, begging bread. And you can look at me and, and see, I've not missed many meals. God will take care of you. But I want you to know, I want you to understand, I want you to understand that Jesus is concerned. Now watch, Jesus is in the temple. And by the way, Jesus made it a habit of going to the temple. Did you know that if Jesus is walking on earth today, He'd go to church? Did you know the Bible says that it was His manner or His custom? He had a habit of going to church. Somebody says, well, you don't have to go Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. No, you don't have to, but I want to do what Jesus would do. This is my church. This is our church. If I wasn't a preacher, I'd be in church Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night because that's where God's meeting with His people. And that's where God is blessing His people. And that's where God is speaking to the hearts of people. Now, I'm a counselor, and I have a degree in counseling. I have a doctorate in counseling, an earned doctorate in counseling. But I think I can say this, and I did that because I wanted to be able to help people. But I think I can say this. I can do more counseling and better counseling on Sunday morning in a message and Sunday night in a message and Wednesday night in a message than you can one-on-one. -on -one. I've learned that down through the years. Jesus was in the temple, He was in the house of God, and He was near the treasury. Look again. And Jesus sat over against the treasury and beheld how the people cast money into the treasury. And so down through the years, every time the offering plate passes by, every time that you gave, every time you fail to give, I believe this scripture teaches along with others that the Lord observed our giving. And by the way, He's here this morning, and He's watching what we're doing, and He knows our hearts. And then notice He was close to people, right there with them. He noted the rich as they cast money into the treasury, and they cast in very much. Now, He cares about our giving. 
I want you to get that again. I want you to think about that. The Lord cares about our giving. Does He care about our ministry? Sure. Does He care about your family? Yes. Uh, does He care about the everyday things of your life? Yes. But He cares about your giving as well. He's very concerned about that. Then not only does He care about it, He challenges us in our giving. All through the Bible you see that principle all the way through that He challenges us in the matter of giving. Now some people have never been taught to tithe. I was 17 when I brought my first message. 18 when I pastored my first church. Now by that time I'd heard the criticisms about preaching on giving. By that time I'd heard all of the facts and figures, and I'd heard all the things about all the church wants is money, all the preacher wants is money. And frankly, I was nervous about it, didn't want to do it, because I didn't want to get the reputation of just caring about money. And then when God began to deal with my heart and began to see how important it was, I said, Lord, I want you to forgive me. I'll never feel bad about preaching on money again. I'll never feel bad about preaching on tithing again. And down through the years, I don't apologize for it because it's in the Word of God. I know what giving can do for you. There's so much under, misunderstanding about it. Well, if I give, then, then God will make me a millionaire. There's nothing in the Bible that says God will make you a millionaire if you give. Now, there's indication in the Scripture that God has a way of blessing those that do give. And the Bible says that He will give back to us good measure, pressed down, and running over. And the Bible says the Lord will use people to do that for you above what I'm going to do for you. There's evidence in the Scripture that those that gave sacrificially and liberally had the great hand and blessings of God upon them. The church at Philippi and other churches. And then there are some that just simply refuse. They they're just going to disobey. They're not going to give. They're going to do their own thing. I can't do anything about that. I can't make you give. I'm not going to try to make you give. Because I want you to give because you feel that God has commanded you in the Scripture, that you want to give, that you've got a hold of it. But I'll say this to you this morning. If you fail in that area, you're missing out on the tremendous blessings of God. Then I want you to notice that not only does He care about our giving and challenges us about our giving, but He claims our resources. He claims our resources. All through the Scripture you see it. It's amazing to me. Just a, a little woman, and Jesus cared about her, saw what she was doing. He saw those that were giving much, that were rich, and frankly, He wasn't very impressed. Did you get that? Can you imagine, I think I can, uh, the look on these people's faces as they gave. Look at me. Look at what I'm giving. And yet Jesus was unimpressed. Notice the second thing in verse 41 and verse 42. Who he sees. Who he sees. Look at it again. And Jesus sat over against the treasury and beheld how the people cast money into the treasury. And many were rich that cast in much. And there came a certain poor widow, and she threw in two mites, which makes a fathering. He saw their money, and he saw their motive. Now, I believe the Lord wants us to give proportionately when we give. But I look at verse 42. And there came a certain poor widow, and she threw in two mites. You know what that is? One-fourth of a cent. One-fourth of a cent. Here are the rich people casting in their abundance. This little lady casts in one-fourth of a cent, and Jesus raises up. And his emotion is stirred. And he looks at that, and he said, Look! Look! Not only the disciples standing by, but it's written in the Word of God, and be there until Jesus comes, that here's a little lady that's given one-fourth of a cent, and she's given more than them all. Isn't that amazing? He sees our giving. He realizes that we're to give uh, proportionately. By the way, did you know that tithing was before the law? Go back to the book of Genesis and go back to Abel, uh, bringing an offering, bringing a sacrifice to the Lord. Go back to the uh, giving of the tithe to Melchizedek. So you can't say 
that tithing is in the law. And a lot of people use that as an excuse. No, tithing was before the law and it was given proportionately. If I make $100, I give $10. If I make a dollar, I give 10 cents. Everyone can have a part in giving to the work of God. We're to give proportionately. We're to give properly. And we'll get into this a little bit later on. You don't give to just anybody. You give to the storehouse. Where is the storehouse? The house of God. Now, I will say this. When you join a church, you realize you're going to be giving to that church. You're going to be tithing there. You're going to be giving your offerings there. You're going to be giving your faith promise there. So one thing I would look for is this. How is the money received in that church? And how is it counted? And how is it taken care of? All of that's important. And in our church here, we do not want that to be shoddily done. And we want to make sure that every penny is accounted for. And I'll guarantee you one thing, as long as Brother Perry is here, one-fourth of a cent will be counted for. The man knows his business. And he spends hours and hours, and, and I've, I've watched him over there trying to find this penny, trying to make sure. And before he hands me a write-up, every week, every month, everything is accounted for. And that's the way we want it to be. That's the way it should be. Amen? Making sure the tithes and offerings you give go to where it is to be given. It's handled properly, and God blesses that. And so you give, and you give to the storehouse, and it's handled properly. It's meted out properly to the right resources, and you can give uh, confidently to the work of God. And then we're to give perpetually. Just keep on giving. Just keep on giving. Look at verse 43 through verse 44, and notice what Jesus says. And he called unto him his disciples. Let's stop there just a second. I, I just get the picture here. Here's rich people casting in a lot of money. It doesn't get Jesus' attention, doesn't draw his attention at all. He doesn't make mention of it. A little lady cast in one-fourth of a cent, and Jesus says, Hey, boys, come over and take a look. And he called unto him his disciples. He saith unto them, Verily I say unto you that this poor widow has cast more in than all they which have cast into the treasury. For all they did cast in of their abundance, but she of her want did cast in all that she had, even all her living. You know, I think this lady gave thankfully. I think she was thankful that she had something to give, even though it was one-fourth of a cent. And your tithe might only be a dollar or ten dollars, but you're obeying God. And by the way, God has a way of taking a few dollars and stretching it and meeting needs. I believe she gave cheerfully. Do you see any remorse here? Well, it's Sunday again. Got to write out my check again. Little boy walked down the aisle, and an old fellow sitting there, and he handed the offering plate to him. He just sat there. He put it in his face again. He just sat there. Put it in his face again. He just sat there. And the little boy said, Well, take some out. It's for the heathen. Some people just hold on and hold on and hold on. I don't know why it is, but in our Baptist churches, have you ever noticed when the offering is received, it's usually placid music? Why is that? So it won't hurt us so bad or something? I, so it'll, it'll soothe us when we that money's ripped from our side? I, I don't know. Uh, maybe, our, maybe our ladies ought to play something a little more moving with a little more rhythm. Uh, as we give. Now, some churches do that. Amen? And I have yet to ever hear anybody shout during the offering. Have you? I mean, I've just not heard anybody shout during, during the offering. Woo! <laughs> you know, uh, we shout at other times. Well, that's a time you ought to shout. Amen? You're giving to God. You're obeying Him. And we ought to give liberally. She gave liberally. It wasn't much, but it was liberally. She gave sacrificially to the work of God. Now, I know what the devil will try to say to you. I know what your emotions will try to do to you. But just simply obey God in the matter of giving. 
He'll take care of you, and you watch what He can do through you and through your church. What did, what did Jesus think this morning as He came to our church, took a close look at the offering this morning,